Let's go to Galatians chapter 4, verses 1 to 7. God is the Father of glory. 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 Ephesians 1, 7 says he's the Father of glory because he gives birth to children gloriously and he inherits to his children gloriously. So that makes him the Father of glory. Do you know the Father of glory, your Father of glory? Amen. Who is that? Who is, the, who is your Father of glory? Yeshua. Yeshua. Amen? So you, if you have faith, you believe him and long for him. Long for the Father of glory, your Father of glory. And your faith life then is fighting to seize the inheritance of the Father. What do we need to do? What's Christian life about? Fighting to seize the inheritance of the Father. Matthew eleven twelve says, From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has been subject, subjected to violence, and violent people have been raiding it. So what Jesus was saying was that the kingdom of heaven has been raided. Like when you think about raiding, you're not thinking about heaven. You don't think heaven and violence and raids. You don't put them all together in the same context because you think about the kingdom of heaven as being very, very peaceful and calm. Raids is something that you do in a war setting. You're raiding, you know, and, and to someone else's palace or city and plunder, you know, taking out the plunder and so on. But what Jesus reminds us is that the kingdom of heaven has been being attacked. It has to be attacked violently, and it's the violent people who raid it, who seize it. And that's the kind of heart and the effort that the children of God ought to have to take the inheritance of the Father of glory. Amen. Amen. So if, if we have a father, um, our father's heart uh, is to want to inherit uh, the best for their, uh, their children. That's just nature. Uh, what parents want is the best for their children. And if they own anything to their name, they want to give to their children. It's human nature. I tell you that. It's human nature. Uh, but the reality is not everyone ha uh, has things to pass down. And uh, unfortunately, in some cases, instead of passing down something that's sort of um, plus on the balance scale, they end up passing down the negative on the balance scale. So in that sense, it's not really good inheritance at all. But the heart of the father never uh, is, in any case, to want to inherit the best. Because if they gave birth to their children, uh, they have passed down their blood, their name. And with the blood and the name, they want to give the best um, for their children in the future. So we, this is universal. It's a universal truth. It's, this is regardless of the times or culture. Uh, it is true. It was true thousands of years ago, centuries ago. It is true in Europe as it is true in Asia. It is true in the United States. It is true everywhere, all time. Uh, and whether it's a family business or a corporation um, or even a nation, uh, the heart of a parent is to give and pass it down to his um, child. So when you think about in the setting of monarchy, um, the, royal, uh, the royalty is continued uh, by the bloodline. So it doesn't matter if you're the strongest, the, um, the smartest guy on earth. If you're not born into the family, then you cannot become uh, the next in line to take the throne. Um, unless in some cases by marriage you can become, but uh, most of the time it is by birth. It's a birthright. Uh, but in the older times, even, uh, even as, a, let's say, the next in line, uh, like a prince, um, uh, to, to take the throne after the father, the king, uh, passes, uh, had to prove himself to be worthy of the throne. So he couldn't just get a, you know, automatically like a free ride to the throne, but he actually had to learn um, not just uh, knowledge from books, but also the skills to fight. Because if you think about it, in those societies, like feudal societies, or true tribal societies, they, they earn the title, they earn uh, their leadership by fighting. 
and they had to prove to the people as well as their father that they are ready and qualified to become the next leader. Right, to, even though the father worked very hard to prepare this kingdom or, or, or nation for the next in line, the next in line had to prove, work hard, and make sacrifice to be proven of a, uh, to be a, a good uh, and competent fighter worthy to inherit the throne. So uh, with sacrifice, one would have to continue that uh, legacy. But what happens uh, in, in the modern context is that when parents work very hard and let's say they establish a company that was like a small scale, middle scale, and then goes to a corporation level, uh, and then they you know, pass it down to their children, and children inherit it without any work, any sacrifice, um, they go to private schools and they're sort of, they live a shelter life. Uh, and then when it's time that they sort of learn how, you know, they, they know that they have to be the one who has to run, uh, run the company, then because they did it without any sacrifice, they did not pay a price to uh, become the leader, what happens is that it can be just as uh, easy to lose it uh, at any time. So um, that's what happens, even though the first generation work very hard to prepare inheritance for the next generation. If the next generation does not appreciate the value of that inheritance, does not work for it, does not fight for it, does not struggle for it, then the next generation can easily lose it. So what am I trying to say? If God is our Father in heaven, and that's what the Bible tells us, do you believe that you have Father in heaven? Yes. Our, our Heavenly Father, let's say that together. Our Heavenly Father, our Heavenly Father, our Father in Heaven. We have Father in Heaven, and if we have Father in Heaven, if our earthly Father wants to give us something, how much more for our Heavenly Father, who has given us His precious life through the death of the one and only Son? Wouldn't He want to give us all the good and perfect gift? Amen? Then, knowing that heart, we need to trust Him that he has prepared the best thing for us as inheritance, knowing that, then we need to be determined to work, to fight, to struggle, to take possession, to seize that inheritance that he has in store for us. Amen. Amen. Now, how did God make us then? As Hebrews uh, chapter 2, chapter 1, chapter 2, uh, describe that different from angels, God made man, from the dust of the ground, in the weakness of the flesh. And elsewhere in the Bible it tells us, God knows how we are formed because it is he who formed us. He's not surprised when we tell him, Father, I'm weak. Father, help me, help us. He doesn't say, what? Why are you weak? What, are, what is this I hear? He, he knows all because that's the way he made us. He knows that we are weak, we are weak formed um, in uh, formed uh, by the dust of the ground that makes us weak and much weaker than the angels. Now, by contrast, how are angels made? Do they have flesh? No. What do they have? Spirit. spirit is their body. They have personality like us, but their spirit is their body. So they do not have flesh. So what does that mean? Without the flesh, they don't have a lot of problems that we have. Right? First, they don't have to eat. So they don't have to go to groceries. They don't need money. They don't need to pay the bills. So they send, then you can think like, oh man, how come he didn't make us like angels? <laughs> right? How come he, does, he didn't make us like angels? Angels have no problem. They don't have family. They don't get married. They don't procreate. So they don't have children. They don't have problems like family problems. You know, They don't have like conflicts and tensions and dramas and, 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 and problems to resolve. They don't have any of that. They don't have sickness. So condition and wise, they're, they're superior to humans. But what the Bible tells us is that God had no plan to give inheritance to angels. And it is not the angels that God helps, but it's those who are formed in the weakness of the flesh that he helps, the children of Abraham, and it is for them God prepared the best to inherit. Now that's good news. Amen? So he formed us from, uh, formed from the dust of the ground. That's how this flesh is made. But into this flesh, God breathed his breath and made another being into this flesh man and made man a living being. Altogether, a living being. 
So Genesis 2-7 tells us, God breathed into one man made of dust, his breath, the breath of life, and made the man a living being. And that living being now not only eats the flesh food, like material food, but now it needs to eat spiritual food. So we need two kinds of food. We need flesh that's, we need food that's material, but we also need food that's spiritual for the spirit that we are. And the word is the spirit food, the word of God. And God said to this first living being, what was his name? Adam. And said, do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil that was placed in the garden of Eden where he lived. Because if you eat of it, you will surely die. So that was the word given as food, as command to the living being. Why was it that, again, he's formed in the flesh and now he had to obey on top of that? Obey. And to obey, you have to struggle to obey because it's easier to disobey than to obey. Right? Because if you tell somebody, like, don't turn around, what do they want to do? Turn around. It's just human nature. Like kids sit still. They don't want to sit still. Why? No. First thing they learn from you is no. Like you tell them no, and then they repeat back. Come, no. Eat that, no. No, no, no. They always want to test. They always want to rebel because it's easier to do that. It's a human nature to not want to follow. Yet what God expects men to do is to, in order, in order to be blessed and become heirs of God, we have to go through what's called sacrifice or suffering. And that is just uh, by principle that all men have to go through in order to become heirs of God. And that's why God put boundary to what Adam can have in the garden. Other than that, Adam can have whatever he wanted except from that one tree. He did okay for a while, but there was a serpent that approached the woman who came from the man. She ate that forbidden fruit with the temptation. If you eat of it, you will be like God. You will not surely die, but you will be like God. With that temptation, the woman ate the forbidden fruit and gave to the man, and he ate it too. Instead of becoming like God, however, sin came to man. Sin came inside his spirit. Remember, sin is to be separated from God. So Adam then, Adam and Eve, were banished from the garden to be to make this uh, a reality, physical reality. So sin means to be set up, set, separated from God. You have no part in God's plan, no part in God's inheritance, his blessing. And by kicking them out of the garden, God showed that to Adam. So they could not return to the garden again. But not only that, what we find in 2 uh, Peter 2, 19, is that Adam and thereafter all men became slaves of the devil. What did all men become? Did men know that? Did you know that? No. What do you mean slave? I was never a slave. That's what most people thought. And that's why God began his work of materializing that uh, spiritual slavery into a physical one. Uh, and he did that uh, by calling on, first calling on one man. Which man is that? Now you're thinking, which man are you trying to tell us? Inheritance, calling a man. It was actually Abraham. Very good. Before God called Moses, it was Abraham. Now Abraham was named Abram at the time of God's calling. And when God called him, he was childless. And in Genesis 15, to this childless man, God said, I will give you many, many descendants. How many? How many? Can you count the stars in the sky? No. And your descendants will be as many as those stars. Can you count the, gray, the sand, uh, sand grains on the, on the seashore, on the beach? No. But your descendants will be as many as they. So God blessed Abraham uh, when he did not have any child to have many descendants come from him. It was like a big teaser. It's like, are you kidding me? I don't even have my own son, so I have to get a slave in, in place of my wife so that she will become pregnant so uh, that she can somehow make me feel better, make us feel better that we have some offspring, but he's not even our own. And now you're telling me we're going to have so many descendants. But Abram was man of faith, so he believed. Not only that, God promised him a physical solid inheritance. What else did God promise him? The inheritance of land, a piece of land. Where? In Canaan, in the land of Canaan, now where Abraham was standing at the time. God said, 
Your many, many descendants will become many, many, many way as they live for 430 years in a foreigner's, you know, in a stranger's country. And then they will be brought back after that and they will take possession of this land because I'm going to, I'm going to give you this land as your inheritance. And Abraham believed that. So well, later on, um, by Genesis 17, 18, 18 we, go, we see that God visits uh, Abraham's home and then promises them that they will have a child a year later. Now remember, God promised the seed, like offspring, in Genesis 15. That was already many, many years ago. But he shows up later on. He's still childless, and he says, I did not forget your, my, I did not forget the promise. I did not forget the blessing. Uh, you will have a child uh, it, this time a year later. Now, hearing this, Abraham just probably nodded. But his wife in the kitchen preparing the yogurt and the butter, what happened? She laughed. Oh, LOL. LOL. <laughs> it's like, okay, because I'm 90. I'm almost 90. My husband is almost 100. Um, how does this happen, by the way? Like, we didn't have any luck to this day. And then suddenly you show up. We're almost going to celebrate our 100th birthday and 90th birthday, and you're telling us we're going to have a baby next year. So she laughed. And then God said to her, what was her name, by the way? Sarah. But Sarai was her name at the time. And um, so Abram and Sarai. But God said to her, you, uh, in Genesis 17, your name will be Sarah and your name will be Abraham. So they become the name. The names become their destiny, which is mother of nations, father of many nations, right? So in the Hebrew context, name means their destiny. So when they're childless, they already have this name that they're going to become father and mother of many nations, even though they have no child of their own. So when she says, oh, oh, you know, she's laughing, and the Lord said, I heard you laughing. And what did she say? No, I didn't. And then the Lord said, yes, you did. <laughs> and then they go back and forth. It's just like, oh, my gosh. It's almost God is trying to, like, win over that fight. Yes, you did. No, I didn't. Yes, you did. So that was a very significant moment because a year later, because they believe in the promise of God, now, remember, when, the, when, when they received the promise that they were going to have a child next year, they didn't just be like, okay, let it be done. It didn't happen like that. They had to go to work, right? <laughs> Ralph feels very uncomfortable when I say this. But anyway, they had to go to work. They had to go to work. They had to get busy. So when they did get busy, then they got pregnant the year later, and they had a baby. Do you believe that? And he was named what? Which means? Laughter. So the laughter that Sarah made at the thought of having a baby at the age of 100 for her husband and 90 for her, uh, that laughter then becomes a reality when they finally hold the baby. And it's not the laughter because like, oh my God, finally I have a baby and I can show him off to all my friends. No, no, no. It's the fulfillment of God's promise that they're actually seeing the future of their inheritance in their hands, therefore the baby is named laughter. Amen. Now then what happens to this laughter baby? He grows up, and then, then when he's about, you know, he's coming of age, so we're probably thinking somewhere between 18 to 20, God shows up to Abraham and says, oh, Abraham, by the way, that kid that I gave you, it's time for you to kill him and give him back to me as a burnt offering. Now, Abraham was a man of great faith. He never complained. He never questioned. He said, Amen. And he packed up his stuff, he rolled, you know, he took wood, he took the fire, he loaded up the ant, uh, donkeys, and he traveled for days to go up to Mount Moriah, which was the place where God told him to go to give this burnt sacrifice. Now remember, burnt sacrifice was to kill with a knife and then with fire, so kill it twice. Now again, Isaac was coming of age, so Isaac was no baby. He knows everything, right? So. He knows what's going on. He sees the dad loading up the animals and getting ready to give sacrifice to God. But there is one big piece missing. What was missing? The sacrifice. Father, here's the wood, here's the fire, but where is the sacrifice? And what did the father say? God will provide. Isaac was not dumb dumb. He knew. He knew that something was up. Now, if the father was going like, God will provide you dumb dumb, it's you. Then, then, then Isaac would have been like, see you later, and then run the other way. But what makes Isaac an heir, worthy to be an heir of Abraham, was that even though he put two and two together, 
he complied. It doesn't say it like in those words, but he complied. He agreed with what his father was doing. You see, Abraham was blessed to become the, uh, to receive the inheritance from God, many descendants and the land. But it had to go through Isaac. And Isaac also had to prove his faith. And his faith was to trust God and trust his father. So meanwhile, when the father goes and he leaves his servant, you know, at the bottom of the mountain, and then he goes up, and then he goes up with Isaac, and then Isaac is bound on top of the altar to be killed. And again, his father is an old man, and Isaac has the strength to overcome him, but he doesn't. He complies quietly. There's no record of him resisting or questioning. So we see that in Isaac that he's qualified, he's worthy to become an heir of Abraham because he's just lying down, ready to be killed. And Abraham, in his heart, did kill him because he raised that knife to just bring it down through the heart of his own son that he received at the age of 100. How was he able to do that? Because he believed, as Romans later says, that God is able to bring back to life even from ashes, that he can bring back life from the burnt ashes because he knew that he, through his experience of having a child uh, through a body that was as good as dead, God is certainly able to bring back from the dead the life of his son. So in his heart, he did not doubt for a minute in 100% uh, confidence, assurance, he was ready to run through that, run that knife through the heart of his own son. But of course, we know how that story goes. Did he have to do that? No. There was voice from heaven saying, Abraham, Abraham, do not touch that lad. Do not lay your hand on that lad. For now I know you fear me. Instead of him, I prepared a sacrifice for you. So by faith, uh, he obey the word of God, and he struggled with it, but he, uh, he continued that struggle to receive this inheritance and then finally pass it down to Isaac. Now remember, God is the God of Abraham, and who else? The God of Isaac, and then the God of Jacob. So we got to go to the next heir. So Isaac proved himself to be worthy to receive the inheritance from Abraham, then that has to go to Jacob. Now, if you know the story of Jacob, uh, and if you know the, tr like the trend, and even to this day, the birthright or the inheritance goes to the firstborn male. In the traditional society, it's the firstborn male. Any family tree that you see in a traditional society, traditional way, is that first male gets his name recorded in the family tree. The women don't even make it, right? So it's the firstborn male. So Jacob was actually a twin. And when he was in his mother's womb, he was, he was with his brother, who was, who ends up being the older one, because he comes out first. Uh, but when the mother is pregnant in Genesis 25, there's word from God saying, the older will be, older will serve the younger, and the younger will be served by the older. So there's a prophecy about the younger one becoming the heir of Isaac. So, um, you would think that Isaac would some, was going to come out first, but no, Isaac actually becomes the second, and the, the first one who is red is named what? Esau. That's what the name means. He's red. And then the second one who comes out right after him comes out holding onto the heel of his brother because Jacob means to hold, to grasp, right? So he's holding his brother to probably like the, the midwife who goes, hey, there, I see a little hand in there. He's, he just came out. You better name him Jacob because that's what it means. So his name was Jacob. So Esau and Jacob. Esau by birth was the older one who was to become the heir of Isaac. And that's what he had for up to a certain point. But now his mother, Rebecca, their mother, Rebecca, knew about this prophecy of the word of God, word from God saying the old younger will be the heir. Waited for the mo right moment. Now there was a point where, so they grew up. Uh, Esau was a uh, manly man, you know, he liked to hunt and he liked to go out and do physical things, but Jacob was not so manly man. He was, he liked, he was more uh, domestic, like he liked helping out at home, mommy, do you need the dishes or you want me to get the fire for the cook, it, cook the food, and it was the good son. He was sort of like uh, mom, mama boy, I guess, mama boy, so he's always around. And one day, the manly man brother shows up all famished because he just finished hunting and he's so hungry. And the younger brother, what is he making? His pot of stew, waiting and waiting. Who knows how many times he made that stew because he's waiting for his brother to show up. And he wants, because just by nature, he is very cunning 
and he's an opportunist. And he wants what his brother has, which is his birthright. And he was waiting for his brother, probably not just that one day he made the soup, but the stew, but he probably made many, many pots of stew waiting for his brother. Sometimes brothers, I'm not hungry, I ate it already on the road. <laughs> or, or like he waits and his brother never shows up. But that day, they meet and the brother said, I am so hungry, can you give me some of that? And then the brother said, not until you give me what I want. And what, what, what do you want? I'm so hungry, what, what good is, you know, all the stuff that I have, I don't care. And then the brother said, well, you know what, I want your birthright. I want your birthright and let's trade it with the soup. And Esau is going like, what the heck good, what, what good is, what the heck, excuse me, what the heck. So what good is this birthright? It's not going to fill me up, so give me the pot, uh, bowl of stew, let's trade it. Because birthright, you don't even have it on a piece of paper. It's just an abstract thing. So he just wants hungry. He just wants like the instant gratification of getting his tummy filled. And he did. But then birthright moves on to Isaac. But we don't see that happening physically until a little later. When the father Isaac becomes old and he's sort of like borderline senile and he's losing sight and hearing. Yeah, because he really can't, you know, distinguish um, by sight or uh, even hearing, but he's really old and he's getting near his death. So he's ready to bless his heir. So the mother says to Jacob, your father's ready to give him that blessing to, uh, to, for inheritance. This is the moment that, that the word of God is going to come true. So you're going to go and, and, and get some meat and I will cook it the best way your father likes it. And then you're going to bring it to your father and he will bless you as the firstborn. And Jacob is going like, yeah, but father can't see, and he's a little bit like checked out, but he can still hear me. I'm not Esau, and I don't have hair. I guess his skin was very smooth also. So he's, I don't have hair. I don't, I'm not that manly. I don't have the voice. I don't have the body. He's going to figure it out. And uh, Rebecca's mother said, don't worry. If he's going to curse, let the curse fall on me. You do what I say. You do as I say. So he's like his heart is thumping and thumping and thumping and gets the meat and then he's helping the mom grill the meat in the kitchen and they're barbecuing, grilling and cooking the way the dad likes it and then brings the dad. And the mom uh, brings like a patch of uh, you know, hair, fake hair to be worn around his body so when the father touches him that he, it feels like Esau. So the father eats the meat and says, okay, now I'm time for blessing. And he says, okay, you know, I'm here, I'm here father, I'm Esau. And he says, hmm. Sounds like Jacob. Come over here. Let me, let me smell you. Let me touch you. It's like, sounds like Jacob, but feels like Esau. Okay, all right. So let me bless you. So he gives all this blessing to pass on his inheritance to his, who he thinks is firstborn, but it's really Jacob. And then Jacob receives that firstborn blessing of inheritance and then goes. And the rest is history, right? Because Esau figures it out, and he wants to kill his brother. And he says, Father, do you have any blessing left? And the so-called blessing that the father has left for Esau is, you will serve your younger brother. <laughs> so Esau is all the more upset. He says, okay, I'm going to kill my brother, crush that guy and break into pieces. I'm going to go after him. And then uh, Jacob is on the run. He goes to his uncle's home, and he lives there for decades. And, and during that time, he becomes wealthy. He has two wives and two midwives, and how many sons? Twelve sons and, and daughters and maids and animals. He's a wealthy man. And when it's time, I'm like speed fast forwarding, and it's time for him to come back to his father's house. Now, when he's coming back home, he hears the news. His brother is coming to meet him with 400 other guys. And then Jacob says, oh, that's nice. Maybe a parade? No, they're coming with sticks and stones. They're going to kill me, right? Because he's a very smart guy. And he says, all this that I have gained as a result of God's blessing and my hard work would belong to no one if he takes my life. So let me send ahead all the things, all the people and all the things that belong to me over the river. Which river? River Jabbok. So I'm going to send them over the river and I'm going to kneel down and seek God's mercy. So he sends his, his um, animals, his servants, his, his uh, uh, you know, wives and his children, sons. All of them are across the river and his alone. And he's praying. And he meets a man in the middle of the night. And he was a man of God. And what does he do with him as soon as he meets him? He wrestles with him. And he wrestles with him all night. And finally the man says, already, what is your name? 
He says, my name is Jacob. Can you tell? My name is Jacob. I was grabbing and wrestling. And then the angel said, oh, no, your name's not Jacob anymore. I'm going to give you a new name. And what's that? The name Israel. And what does the name Israel mean, folks? You have, re you have wrestled with God, struggled with God, and struggled with men, and you have overcome. So even though this man, who was this man anyway? Was it God? No, it was an angel of God. But it, the angel of God who, whom Jacob met, he wrestled with, and the angel said, okay, you won. And as a result, I'm going to have to give you this blessing, which is in the name Israel. You struggle with God and with men, you overcame. Now remember, Adam, who did he listen to and sin against God? He listened to the serpent. Who is he? He's the devil. Who is he? He's an angel. So all men became slaves of the devil, who is an angel. Here is an angel showing up, and uh, it, uh, Jacob is wrestling with him, and he overcomes him. And as a result, he receives blessing. So I want you to keep that in mind. The angel struggling against angel, and men becoming slaves of the angel, and, and then what God wants to do. So he crosses the river, he gets everything back, his brother forgives him, he gets the better of the land, and with that name, through that name come many, many people, the people of Israel. Do you believe that? Because the descendants believe it to this day. So when they become many uh, and they stay in Egypt for 430 years, the day that it turns 430 years, that is when God uh, had sent Moses and there were 10 plagues and the, and the last plague, which was the Passover night where the firstborn died. The people of Israel left their slavery, left Egypt, left the power of the Pharaoh, and then became the holy people of God and left with the promise of inheriting the promised land, the land of Canaan. Amen. But before they went there, where did they go? They went in the desert. And in the desert, what did they receive from God? They received the law. The law. The law, Acts chapter 7, verse 35 and verse 53 says, the law was given through angels. Now remember, how did the law come about to the people? Who received the law? Which of them? Moses. And Moses received an amount, and they believed that it was who spoke to Moses and, and Moses wrote down or, or himself wrote it was the Lord God right the Lord God wrote down the law and he himself inscribed on the stone tablets and Moses brought them down but what the Bible also says is that actually the law was given through angels so it was not God himself writing but it was the angel in the name of the Lord God who wrote down the law and delivered to the people of Israel so the law came to the people through the angels, and Romans 8.15 says, it's the spirit you received that makes you slaves, makes you fear. Because the law, is also, the law that's called the law of Moses is also called the law of condemnation. Altogether, law of condemnation. what's called the law of condemnation? Huh? All I hear is, what is that? The law of Moses which was delivered by angels. So the law delivered through or by angels was the spirit, I think that's what you were trying to say, the spirit to fear, the spirit of slave. So when they received it, they feared, right? So they feared the punishment of sin because the law came and defined sin. Anyone who is defined to be a sinner, they were condemned to punishment. So the law of condemnation, the law of sin and death, the law delivered through the angels. Now again, it was not the law itself that made men slaves, but it materialized the spiritual reality of all men that we became all slaves. Of who? Not of the Pharaoh, but of the devil. Why? How? Because of sin. Because of sin. And the devil became the ruler of death, wielding the power of death over all men. So all men all their lives with fear under the power of the devil. So to remind that uh, the, the people of Israel had been called by God and that God was their God, their Lord, and they were his people, what did God tell them to build? The sanctuary. What was inside of it? The stone tablets, the Ten Commandments inside the ark. What else? 
the name of the Lord God. Which name is that? Jehovah, the Lord God. Jehovah, which was the name delivered by angels. But the sanctuary reminded them the inheritance that God promised their father, their forefather, Abraham. So again, you know, to this day, when you ask a religious Jew who their spiritual father is, they will say it's uh, Abraham. You know, they say, well, we want to go to paradise. And then you ask them, who's in paradise? They, they say it's Abraham. So they believe that Abraham is their spiritual father. And because it is through Abraham, their people were chosen and promised this inheritance to this day. So to this day, they fight to claim Jerusalem, the land of Canaan, to this day. Even though for thousands of years it belonged to the people of Palestine, and then uh, to this day, those Palestinians are, are you know, oppressed because of the Israeli who came, the Jews who came to conquer the land. And with the help of the world politicians, they got their own land. Uh, but this was the promise that God made to Abraham, their forefather, their uh, spiritual father. So when they looked at the, the, the sanctuary, later the Temple of Jerusalem, they remember this promise. So even as they were occupied by foreign powers, even as they were taken as captives, sometimes as to the Babylonians, like people like Daniel were taken, they would remember and pray in the direction of Jerusalem because that was the land that God gave them and that they will one day live in that land and reign as kings of all nations. So the temple of Jerusalem was nevertheless important. So when man named Yeshua, or Jesus, came and looked at the same temple, what did he say that made them upset? What was he saying? Yes, you just said destroy the temple. I know he said that, but what, what did he mean by that? You will kill me, the temple of my body, but in three days, what's going to happen? I'm going to be risen to life. So he was plainly talking about his death and his resurrection. What was he going to accomplish? By tearing his flesh, he will tear the written code of slavery. What? Tear what? Written code of slavery. In the time of slave trade, the slave owners will have a piece of paper that proved that they paid price for their slave. And the Bible calls it a written code. Colossians 2.14, in the earlier uh, translation, says he canceled the written code. Written code. Written code that says you are a slave. Now remember, when Jesus came, he, he would tear the flesh, his flesh, to tear the written code of slavery. But slave to whom again? What kind of slavery? Slavery under the devil. He would tear so that we will no longer be slaves of the devil, but become what? Heirs of God. Hallelujah. Amen. That's why Jesus said, Matthew 23, 9, Do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father. He's where? He is in heaven. It was the plan of God that sent the Son as man, in the flesh of man, to redeem men from the spirit of servant to ransom them from the spirit of slave to fear and to give them the adoption of sonship. That's why he came as man. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 20, 28. I did not come to be served, but to serve by giving my life as a ransom for many. So when it was time for him to go to the cross, he did not refuse. He willingly went to the cross and willingly laid on his life and willingly died. But when he died, what did he say? It is finished. Once again, what did he say? It is finished. When Jesus said it is finished, it was the moment he was finishing, completing the will of the Father. What is the will of the Father? Who is our Father? Quick review. Who is our Father? Who is our God? God is the Father of glory. He gives birth gloriously. He inherits gloriously. Everything about him? Is glorious. So it was his plan to receive glory. And the way he was going to receive glory was through the glorious one. Who was the glorious one? Now remember, angels were made to worship God, to glorify God. But they're creatures. So he's not glorified by creatures. Who is he really glorified by? 
the glorious, the glorious one who is God, who was with God in the beginning. Who am I talking about? Yeshua. Yeshua when he was with the Father, you call him, we call him the Word. The Word. And with the Father God, he was as the Word, and as the Word, he had glory in him. But when it was time, he came in the flesh and looked nothing like someone who was glorious. In fact, he came in the likeness of a man, taking the very nature of a servant. Let's go to Philippians 2, 6. Philippians 2, 6 to 11. Can you give me a little bit more monitor? 2, 6. Let's read that out loud. You need to help me. My voice is not back all together yet. So in one voice from 6. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death even death on a cross so it says he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant remember servant or slave is nothing owns nothing knows nothing cannot do anything on his own because that's what a slave is slave must be dictated by the will of his master so becoming nothing means to become a slave. A slave means to become nothing. So how did he become a, a, like a slave? A, taking the very nature of a servant, he was made in human likeness. Do you understand? Being human, being man, is being a slave because that's what we are. We were all born dead in sin because we inherited sin from our ancestor, Adam. And by the fact that we have the spirit of Adam in us, that we have sin inside our spirit, on top of that, we sin with our bodies, with our words, with our hearts. Therefore, we are all slaves of the devil. We just did not know it. Slaves of the devil. The devil chained, kept us in the chains, in bondage as our owner, as our master. Jesus, however, who is not one of us, coming in the flesh, took the very nature of a slave, of a servant, and that meant he became nothing. Becoming God, becoming like man, meaning means the glorious one became nothing. Why? It was for the plan of the Father for him to fight gloriously, to take possession for himself, the inheritance prepare for the son. Yes, God prepare inheritance for his children, that's us later on. But first of all, all things in heaven and on earth were made for the son. Colossians 1:16, all things in heaven, on earth, visible, invisible. Powers and thrones and dominions, authorities, everything have, have been prepared for the son. Hebrews 1, 2. He appointed, God appointed the son to be the heir of all things. So for that, what did God prepare in the spiritual heaven for the Son? The throne, the name of the Father, the name Yeshua. But it, even though it was prepared for the Son, remember, everything is connected. Remember what I said in the beginning. Even the next in line has to prove himself to be ready and to be worthy to become the next in line. So he has to learn how to fight, and he has to go out and win battles. And here is the Son of God coming, even though he is God. By taking the very nature of a slave, becoming like man, even though he, who know, he, is, he is the only one who knows no sin, became sin for us on our behalf to go to the cross willingly and humbled himself. He was obedient to the point of death on a cross. And when he did that, the father said, you are my glorious heir. Now take your throne. Take my name. Hallelujah. So we continue. Verse 9, it says, Therefore God exalted him 
to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah. There is the will of God. For the glory of himself, he made all things and sent his son. And for the glory of the Father, the son had to lay down his life. He had to fight. Fight. Who did he fight? Who was his enemy? He came as the kingdom of heaven to crush who? The prince of the world. The ruler of death. And by dying willingly through his death, he crushed, he fought and crushed gloriously the enemy of God, the devil. And therefore, he was proven to be worthy to take the throne, the name, the inheritance the Father prepared for him so that he may reign as the heir of all things forever. Hallelujah. So the devil was crushed because he was the angel without any sacrifice tried to steal the throne of God. Isaiah 14, 12 to 15 and Ezekiel 28. And 1 John 3, 8, he was the one who sinned from the beginning, the origin of sin. Without fighting, without working, without a price, he tried to steal the throne of God. And God considered it a sin and threw him out of the spiritual heaven and waited for this moment to crush him. So again, how did Jesus die? He died on the cross. And the form of the, uh, the death on the cross means to tear the flesh and shed blood. So remember, tearing the flesh was going to be tearing what? The written code of slavery. So when Jesus died, his flesh hung on the tree. It ripped his flesh. It meant he was ripping the written code, piece of paper that said, you belong to the devil. If you belong to the devil, where do you go? You go to where the devil goes, and that is the eternal fire prepared for him. So all men were destined to go to the fire of hell, as Matthew 25, 41 says. We were all supposed to be thrown into the eternal fire because all men sinned in Adam, and we all belong to the devil. But by tearing his flesh, Jesus ripped it apart the written code of slavery, and by shedding his blood, he redeemed, he redeemed those who were under the devil and made a way for them to become heirs of God, children of God, by shedding that imperishable seed of the word. First Peter 1.23 says, the enduring living word of God, the precious blood of Yeshua. Hallelujah. And he died. He breathed his last and he died. But in three days, but in three days, he breathed again, hallelujah, and rose to stand in our defense. And the Father raised him up and took him to the throne in heaven and sat him down where he is to this day and forever as the heir of all things. Do you believe that? Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. He reigns forever and ever, bearing the name that is above all names. Because in that name, Yeshua, some of you are going like, why did they call it Yeshua here? I don't see any Jewish people in here. Jesus is the English name, but doesn't have any meaning itself. Remember, Hebrew names have all meanings. Yeshua, Matthew 121 says, he will save his people from their sins. That's what Yeshua means, Savior. So the name Yeshua was given. Wait a minute, but he was born with that name, wasn't he? He lived with that name. Didn't his family call him Yeshua? Yeah. And he was not the only Yeshua at the time. There were a lot of Yeshuas. Yeshua from Nazareth, Yeshua from Pell Park, Yeshua from Queens, you know, Flushing, Yeshua. Yeah, there were Yeshua everywhere. So what's so special about that name? He said, the name that I have come is a father's name. I have come in my father's name and you have not received me. If I have come in a different name, you would have received me. So with the Father's name, he came and he worked for that name. However, only when he died for the glory of that name, the Father would give him as the eternal inheritance that no one can ever take away from him. No one can ever challenge him. No one can ever challenge the throne and the power, the authority, and the name Yeshua ever. Hallelujah. He did not leave us leave the world that way. He did not leave the world abandoned that way. What he did at the cross was to shed his blood to give birth to his children. 
and it was only it is only by the Holy Spirit who was sent by by this by Jesus by Yeshua from the throne when the believers call on his name John 1 12 all those who believe in his name will receive the right to become the children of God how many of you have received the name Yeshua what does that mean? You believe the name Yeshua is the name of God. Amen? Amen. And you, you receive the blood of Yeshua, which is spirit, into your own spirit. Amen? Amen? Then you are born again as a child of God. You receive the right to become a child of God. Is this you? Amen. See, I'm a child of God. Turn to your brother and ask him, are you a child of God or are you falling asleep? You, do you like the way I asked the question? Are you a child of God or are you falling asleep? Yeah? Because if you're falling asleep, I'm not sure if you're a child of God. <laughs> really, if I'm talking about your father and what your father has in store for you, how can you fall asleep? Right? How can you look uninterested? How can you look at your phone and think about something else? Like, oh, I'm going to do after the service. I'm going to go on a date. I'm going to do my laundry. Yeah. Yeah, that's what a lot of people say. Where are you going? I'm going to go home and do my laundry. <laughs> is laundry the love of your life? No, it's, it's my only day off. I got to do laundry. Laundry represents these other business. It's just bag of laundry. What your father in heaven has in store and promised for you is much, much greater than anyone in the world can promise you. Amen. Amen. So the Holy Spirit comes to the children of God who have received the blood of Yeshua, the blood of the Father of their spirit, and lets them, lets them know. What does he let us know? Yeah, we sing song like, joy, you turn my sadness into gladness. Joy, joy, joy. He makes us feel good. But remember, I told you, you did feel good. But what happened come Wednesday, you had to go to work. Somebody bugged you, so you got mad. Monday night, you repented for anger. But Wednesday morning, your boss is bugging you, and somebody, customer's coming up and bugging you, and you, you lost it. I mean, did the Holy Spirit leave because you got upset? I don't feel so joyful anymore. The Holy Spirit must have left. But remember the other song, I do not live by what I feel. Amen. I live by faith. Hallelujah. So the Holy Spirit has nothing to do with our sight or our mood. Yes, he does give us taste of heavenly joy. That's what you tasted at the retreat. And those of you who did not go for whatever reason, boy, did you miss it. Yeah, I know. I could see in your faces. I should have been there. Yeah, I know. Should have, would have, could have. Yeah, that's it. I understand. But if you were there to receive the blood of Yeshua, you receive the life of your father, and you have been born again as a child of God, and the Holy Spirit, on top of that, you receive the Holy Spirit who comes inside your spirit and tells you, you are an heir of God. You have a father in heaven. It does not matter what your earthly father looks like, what your earthly father has done to you or has not done for you. What your earthly father has done to you or has not done for you. This is why people have problems, right? Their life relationships, because in the beginning, their relationship with their mother and father, a lot of times it's the father. What poor guys, right? Why father? Because maternal love is so physical. It's, it's, it's just basic. But paternal love is something that the father has to work for, to earn the trust and has to show and... And therefore, there's greater expectation from the child for the father. And the child grows up thinking the father should be, be perfect. And when they realize the father's not perfect, and on top of it, the father does things to hurt them, whether it's physical, emotional, or financial, whatever it is, the despair and the hurt is so difficult to handle that it carries on to their life and their relationship with others. So when you bring such people into Christ and tell them you have a heavenly father, they bring the same baggage and say, well, if a father loves me, how come he leaves me like this? It's the same thing. They have problems within the world. They transpose that onto their relationship with God and say, well, if God loves me, how come he doesn't shower me with bags of money? Then a lot of my problems will be gone. Right? If God loves me, why can he buy me a home? Why can he buy a car? Why can he make my family perfect? Why do I have problems? Why? Why? What does the Holy Spirit tell you? 
that you have already received the greatest inheritance, which is the name that is above all names. Amen? Which is that? The name? Yeshua. And with that name, what are you supposed to do? You have to fight and overcome. And only then you will seize the inheritance of the kingdom of heaven in that day. Amen? We cannot, we cannot ignore this principle. Even, the, even Jesus, the Son of God, even Yeshua himself had to abide by the principle of fighting to the point of death, struggling to the point of death. The answer is to die. Temptation comes, what do you do? Die. Well, I have to fight. Yes, you have to fight. Put your fleshly desire to death. That's what death is. Your lust has to be put to death every day, even though all of them were nailed to the cross. As you went into the water, you experienced that. As long as the flesh is breathing, still you have temptation because of the flesh. Because you live in the world, because of the world you have temptation. And because of the world you have worries. So you have to fight. And to fight gloriously means to gloriously lay down yourself to become nothing. God, who knows no sin, became nothing like a slave. How much more for us, who were slaves of the devil, who by the grace of God have been given birth as a child of God. We done nothing. We did nothing to become part of this family, royal family of God. Right? So the prince... The, the royal prince and princess, they did nothing but just the fact that they were born in, this, in the good family, right? Nothing. So without sacrifice, without a price, without suffering, they become the next in line. That's us. We did nothing. All we did was believe. No work is involved. But does that mean that you just, it's a smooth ride off from this point on? No. Now we have work to do. We have to fight, struggle, and fight and overcome all gloriously. Not like, oh, no, not again. It's like, oh, God, let's do this. Jesus, even though he went to the cross, we don't find him complaining. We don't, find, we don't hear him being resentful to God. Instead, he struggled in prayer all night. Father, if it is your will, take this cup away from me. Yet not my will, but your, wills be, your will be done. If it is your will, I will die. And it was the Father's will, so he died. Willingly, gloriously, with dignity, with honor. Because what was waiting after the cross was so much greater than the shame and the pain that he would endure on the cross. So with this effort that you're hearing from my mouth right now from the pulpit, through the Holy Spirit, you're being reminded, you have a Father in heaven. And he knows all your needs because he, no, he knows everything. Before you were formed, he knew. And he prepared the most precious thing, which is the blood of Yeshua. And if you have received that blood, do not expect doing nothing and then finally walking into the kingdom of heaven in that day because it doesn't work like that. To become an heir of God, it's to work while we're in the flesh, to struggle gloriously, fight gloriously, and overcome gloriously. So Romans 8, 8, 14, 17 says, For those who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. The Spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit you receive uh, brought about your adoption to sonship. And by him we cry, Abba, Father. By the Holy Spirit, we call him what? Abba. Call who? Who are you calling Abba Father? Not Jehovah, folks. People who know God as Jehovah never call him Father. I told you, they call Abraham Father. If they know God's name is Jehovah or Yahweh, they, their father is Abraham, not God, because God is their master and they are his slaves or servants. But we have received the blood of Yeshua, so Yeshua is our Abba Father. Amen. Amen. The Holy Spirit lets you know that. And it says, the Spirit himself testify with, testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs. Heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Say that together. Heirs of God, heirs of 
co-heirs with whom? Once again, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs with Christ. Co-heirs with Christ. How can I be a co-heir with Christ? How can I, the sinner, who barely has the faith or willpower to even pray every morning, sit next to Christ, who was obedient to the point of death on a cross? You see, it doesn't make sense because it doesn't happen like that. We have to work. We have to struggle and do it all gloriously. So while in the flesh, to take that heirship, that inheritance, we have to first pray in the name of the Father, the name Yeshua. Because now if we're children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. The Father sent the Son, as we read in Galatians 4, when it was the set time. When the set time had fully come, God sent his Son, born of a woman, under the law, born of a woman, in the flesh, to die. That was the plan of God. To redeem those under the law, that's us, the law of condemnation, the law of sin and death, that's us. To redeem us, the Son of God came under the law so that we might receive adoption to sonship. So we are no longer a slave, but God's child. Since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. So that's why the Bible repeats, like, you're not a slave to sin anymore. You're not a slave in the world. You're not a slave to any other human being. So stop it. Stop living like a slave to another human being. You are a child of God, an heir of God. So why don't you have confidence in the fact that you have inheritance waiting for you. Don't be discouraged about your physical reality and ask the question, well, if God loves me, how come he doesn't take care of my bills? And how come he doesn't take care of my family? How come he doesn't heal my father or mother or heal me? Take my problems away? Then you won't have anything to work for. You won't have any struggles, then you don't take the throne. So praying his name is to make the impossible possible by the greatest inheritance, the name Yeshua, by the power of his name, you are to make the impossible a possible situation. Hallelujah. Amen. So praying, praying to the Abba Father, cry out to Abba Father. But I tried. How much did you try? Well, I tried one month. Did you try like the Son of God going to the cross and dying like a slave? Have you ever tried like God going to the cross like a sinner? If you didn't, you have to keep trying. To the point of death, obedient to the point of death, it is to never give up, to cry out, Abba, Father. Because if he gave us the precious name, the precious blood, wouldn't he hear our prayer? Amen. Amen. So we pray. Pray in his name. Because that's what a child does. That's what prayer is. So after being born again, being baptized, when the church gathers, whether it's Wednesday or Friday prayer meeting, I know it's like, oh, my God, now everybody's calling me to come to church. Now that I was baptized, I was jumping up and down and crying. Now they expect me to go to church every day. It's not me or us expecting anyone to do anything, but it's only the natural thing to do, isn't it? Right? A child of God to be in the house of God. That's what Jesus said when, when he was younger. His parents were looking, where have you been? Why have you treated us like this? We've been looking for you for days and days. And what did Jesus say? Didn't you know that I had to be in my father's house? Isn't it only natural for a child of God to gather in the house of God to pray together as members of the body of Christ? Isn't it only natural? Because if you're not together in the Father's house, what are you doing? Where are you? That's what I want to know. Where are you? Going to the movies, sitting at home, and going out to dinner with friends. A child of God belongs to the house of God. 
belongs to the gathering of his family. Amen. Amen. What else does a child of God, what, is, what else does he have to do? He has to testify the name of the Father. Testify. Go out and testify and be willing to, be willing to suffer for the sake of his name. In Acts 5.41, the apostles were beaten because they were testifying the name Yeshua, but they rejoiced because they had been counted worthy of suffering disgrace for the name. 1 Peter 4, 12 to 16 says, If you are insulted because of the name of Christ, you are blessed for the spirit of glory and of God rests on you. Someone says, shut up. I don't want to hear you talk about Yeshua anymore. Then God bless you because the spirit of God is on you. You are a child of God and heir of God. Hallelujah. If you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed, but praise God that you bear that name. Hallelujah. We have to testify because that's what an heir does. You know what an heir, what else heir does? An heir produces another heir. What do you mean, pastor? I don't have any kids. Do you mean I would need to go and get married and have kids? Actually, no, I don't want you to go and have kids because kids become challenge in your Christian life. But if you do, what are we going to do? But right now, just as you are, what does it mean to produce an heir, to make disciples? Look at Paul's life. Paul never married even. He called Timothy my son. Timothy, my son. He loved Timothy like his own son. So an, an heir produces another heir. And because when, and when they don't produce another heir, they're in agony and shame. Right? If you are next in line, you have to produce another one in line. And if you don't have it, then you have to be in shame. Feel the shame of being childless. In God, in the spirit. Paul didn't say, well, I'm going to go and get married and have children to produce heir. No, he found Timothy and many, many more. But when you look at the relationship between Paul and Timothy, first it was he treated him as his own son. My son. My son, Timothy. He said in 2 Timothy 2, 2, all and the things you have heard me say. He said in verse 3, join with me in suffering like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. He also said in 2 Timothy 3, 10 to 11, you know all about my teaching, Timothy, my way of life, my purpose, my faith, my patience, my love, my endurance, my persecutions, my sufferings, what kind of things happened to me. You've seen all of it, Timothy. So it's not like, hey, you, pastor says you belong to my group, so you must listen to me. It doesn't happen like that. that. That only lasts a little bit. You have to set a pace, set an example. In your faith, in your character, in your faith life, and naturally, next error is produced. Naturally. Naturally. It's not forced. But in your life of prayer and humility and endurance and faith and loyalty, to Christ and his name, his kingdom, those who follow you will see that. Naturally, they will want to learn from you, learn from us, so that they will become co-workers. Romans 16, 21, Timothy, my co-worker, Paul said, my co-worker. We have this blessed inheritance waiting for us where there is no weeping, no suffering, no shame to reign with Christ as co-heirs with Christ, heirs of God. Amen. Do you want to be there in that day? Then in this life, when problem comes, don't be discouraged, but say, I'm going to go on my knees and to the point of death, I will pray in his name and make the impossible possible. Hallelujah. And I will spend every breath of my life testifying his name and produce an heir. Produce an heir. So when he comes back, I will not be in shame. But I would have an heir prepare for him. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Looking at your life, where you are now, do you think people envy you? Do they envy you? Maybe you say, well, I don't have any money. 
I don't have that perfect family for people to envy me. No, no, no. Let's forget about the worldly standards. Do you have that faith and the confidence that comes from knowing that you are an heir of God so that people around you envy you for your faith? Do you have that? You know why you don't? Because you don't know you're an heir of God. You don't have confidence and joy that comes from being an heir of God. To make you an heir, God let his son die like a slave. And all you can think about is money and family. Oh, Father, awaken this dull mind of mine. Cut my heart. Open my eyes so I may catch a glimpse of the glory of the throne you prepare for me. I love you, Father. Father Yeshua. Yeshua. in Christ, we are co-heirs of God. Please, Father, help my brother to not be discouraged about what he sees or what he feels even, but let him be open in his eyes to know that he is an heir of God, that nothing can bring him down, nothing can stop him that together we would encourage each other to struggle and fight gloriously so not one of us will lose this inheritance in that day. Pray, Father! Yes, 